this is Leslie of that mompreneurlife.com. Thank you so much for watching. If you are new here, definitely go ahead and click that like button. We're going to be talking about hereditary anemia. So if you are a part of the hereditary anemia family, or you have a family member or a friend or a loved one who has hereditary anemia, um, definitely let me know in the comments below. Let me know what your story is, what brought you here to this. But I have found that there's not a whole lot of videos of people who have hereditary spherocytosis who are talking about it and sharing their story. They're a lot more sickle cell. Um, so definitely I wanted to come and kind of bring my story, let you guys know what um, hereditary spherocytosis is all about. And I'm not too dressed up today. I'm just kind of vibing. I'm just gonna kind of share a little bit. But I have hereditary spherocytosis. I am 45 years old. So actually, this is October of 2023 that I'm recording this. And I have never had a major issue until September of 2023. So I guess I can count myself as one of the quote unquote lucky ones. I was diagnosed when I was maybe about 12 or 13. And that was because I was in, when I was in fifth grade, my mother came down with a crisis and she didn't know she had it. She was in the hospital because, you know, she was feeling weak and having all the symptoms and everything. She was in the hospital for quite a few weeks and this was back in the eighties, late eighties. And, um, just by trial and error, by testing her blood and all this other stuff, they figured out what was going on and were able to get her treatment. But then when she figured out what she had, she tested myself and my brother, and we both ended up having it. I was always anemic, I guess. I never liked running or doing sports or any kind of physical activity. It was not one of my favorite things to do in life. So I just thought I wasn't an athletic person, just like to kind of be quiet, sit and read. <laughs> Reading was my favorite thing to do. Um, never really thought much of it. But when I found out that I was always going to kind of live life on a mildly anemic level because of um, what was happening with my blood cells in my spleen, kind of gave me a few answers as to why I was never interested in sports. So a little bit about hereditary spherocytosis. Um, blood cells are normally shaped like saucers, so they have a concave kind of shape. But uh, sickle cell, they are shaped like crescent moons. So the blood cells are created in a misshapen shape. My blood cells are also created in a misshapen shape, but it is because there is a protein that's missing on the cell membrane that causes them to balloon out. So instead of being shaped like saucers, like a cup and saucer, they are shaped like basketballs. So they're like balloons, they're round. And that means that they are not able to go through the blood cells as easily and they get caught in the spleen. And the spleen eats them up really easily because it kind of thinks that they are waste to be destroyed. And so my body is constantly kind of eating up its red blood cells. That usually has happened for me on a mild level. So I never have dipped really, except for when I was pregnant, below like a 10, maybe a nine on the hemoglobin level. And that means how oxygenated your blood is. So I've never really gone below that. That's Normally, I'm between 10 and 11, and that's just the way I live. I take folic acid every day just to stimulate my bone marrow to be able to create more blood cells. Um, and it's just something I've known that I've always needed to watch out for and manage and take care of so that it never got worse. However, around Labor Day of 2023, I came down with a random kind of 48 our virus. At first I thought it was COVID. It was giving me COVID symptoms, you know, the sore throat, the cough, the runny nose, a little bit of a fever. 
I just, I was like, okay, it's COVID. Um, and I isolated for about four or five days just so the symptoms would go down. Um, at the end of those four or five days, I was feeling much, much better. And I actually went out, this was on Labor Day, I went out and had pizza buffet um, because I was feeling better and I was feeling like, well, if this is COVID, I, I'm at the end of it. Um, by that evening, I was feeling horrible again, but in a different way. I was feeling heart palpitations, I was feeling chest pressure, I couldn't breathe very easily, and I felt like my energy levels were just going down, 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 and I was so scared, and it didn't feel right. I thought I was going to pass out, I was feeling dizzy, I was feeling, you know, all of those things, lightheaded. And so I actually asked my ex-husband to drive me to the hospital because my current husband is living in Canada. He is not here to be able to help. So I asked for help from my ex-husband who lives in the same city that I live in. And I asked him to drive me to the emergency room. And I did. He drove me there. I was there maybe about seven or eight hours. They got me in really quickly when I told them what was wrong. They did a blood test, read my blood levels, and I was at a 7.7 .7 hemoglobin level. Normal for a woman, hemoglobin is between 12 and 16. I was at a 7.7. .7. I was teetering in the severe anemia area, which is not something I've ever done in life. They actually gave me one unit of blood for blood transfusion. They did only one unit because this particular emergency room usually didn't give blood transfusions until you were at a 7.5. And I was at a 7.7. .7. And so the doctor kind of took pity on me and said, okay, well, we'll give you one unit of blood so that you can go make your appointment with your hematologist when we release you. Now, I did not have a hematologist. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's because I've always had this very mildly. It just slipped my mind. My daughter does have it. So I have it. My mom has it. My daughter has it. My two sons do not have it. But my daughter does. When she actually had a crisis about four years ago when she was in first grade, I got her all set up. She has a hematologist. She has a primary care physician who knows about this but I neglected myself. Isn't that the way moms usually are? So I, I did not have a doctor that I could call up and say, this is happening to me, what, you know, what should I do, meet me at the hospital, nothing. I had nothing. And I told the doctor at the emergency room this and she gave pity on me, gave me the one unit of blood to raise my hemoglobin level only one one point so I probably left the hospital about an eight point something and she told me to just go find a hematologist she gave me a referral a, a name um, and so that's what I did I left and I called that hematologist the next day I also called a primary care physician to make an appointment with him because I didn't I didn't have a primary care physician uh, yeah, girl, I don't know. Anyway, so I made appointments with my primary, with a new primary care physician and a new hematologist. But however, all those appointments were three weeks away. They couldn't get me in any sooner. I was a new, fit, new, new patient. They weren't rushing me. They were just like, we'll get you in when you get you in. And so that was three weeks later. Okay, no issue, no problem, three weeks, great. About two weeks after that initial blood transfusion, I could feel it near, it was going down again. And I was trying to make it to the 26th of September for that appointment. I was trying, but that week before, I just continuously felt horrible. My head was pounding, chest palpitations, hard to breathe, hard to do like very, very simple tasks. I had to take naps throughout the day just to survive. My appetite 
gone. My eyes started becoming jaundiced and yellow. They're not yellow anymore, but I noticed my eyes were getting yellow. My urine was getting super dark yellow. And so all the signs were pointing to the fact that my body was not out of hemolysis. It was still very much in hemolysis. And you know, that one unit of blood wasn't doing very much anymore for me. <laughs> I called the um, hematologist to try to get me in earlier. They told me they could not do so. I went back to the emergency room. That same emergency room, I went back. They read me at a 5.5, like my hemoglobin had gone down to a 5.5. I actually drove myself to the emergency room that time and I parked my car and I remember walking from the car to the front of the hospital was torture. <laughs> I could barely breathe. I had to stop. I had to go at a very slow pace. I was like as my body was trying to get oxygen. <laughs> And they gave me the results and I was at a 5.5 and I was like, wow, that's the lowest I've ever, I have never been that low in life, not in life. So they gave me three units of blood. They read my levels before I left. I was in the, the emergency room for like 11 hours with like through the whole thing giving them me giving them giving me three units of blood took about 11 hours again they got me back there really quickly once they realized what was going on I waited less than 10 minutes in the waiting room um that got me up to a 9.1 I think when I left and then I finally had my hematologist appointment three or four days later now Let's pause and talk about these blood transfusions. I have all respect for people who have to get these on a regular basis and whose life is blood transfusions. You go, you've gone since children to get them every month because they're not fun. It's not fun getting a blood transfusion. Number one, I feel like I was having an allergic reaction, kind of delayed because the first two times I got one, I started to shake like it was something I couldn't control. Halfway through the bag, I started to just shiver and just violently kind of and I couldn't stop and I would be doing it for like 30 minutes. And they told me I was just cold. So they brought me blankets. But I I feel like that was maybe an allergic reaction that they weren't just paying close attention to I, and because every time after I would get a blood transfusion I just would feel ill I just wouldn't feel well it would take me about two days before I started to feel really good some people talk about having blood transfusions and you just are like Ooh, I have all this energy no it would sap all the energy out of me and then I would be just like feeling icky and gross for about a day or two until things kind of pushed through and subsided. So more power to you guys who get blood transfusions all the time. I ended up having three transfusions all together. I finally had the hematology appointment. He finally saw me, got to answer all my questions. And he's like, we're just gonna monitor you. We're hopefully gonna have this where it's just, cause you're normally mild. Hopefully this is just a virus. The viral thing just kind of threw your body out of whack and you'll get back into stasis and you'll stabilize but we're gonna monitor to make sure that happens so that day had my blood drawn had my hemoglobin right again and it was at an eight point something an 8.1 something like that so the report from that was that you're still in hemolysis because you left the hospital at a 9.1 you're at an 8.1, about four days later, you're still going backwards. So they ordered me one more blood transfusion. Not at the emergency room this time. This time I just walked up to the hospital 
and it was an outpatient procedure. Took all day. I got two units of blood at that one. So after that blood transfusion, of course, it took about two, three days for me to feel normal and well again after that. And that Wednesday, I got my blood checked one more time. So I should have probably left the hospital at about a 10 something after the blood transfusion. And on that Wednesday, when I got my blood drawn, I was still at a 10. And you couldn't have found a more happier person. I was just praising, okay? Praising because that meant my body wasn't going backwards. I'm actually going back to get monitored one more time this week. And I think I'm seeing the hematologist too. But we're just going to make sure I'm still out of 10, not going backwards. Because 10 is my normal. And if that's all the case, I'm out of the clear, I'm out of the woods for now. But again, 10 is not normal for normal people. 10 is normal for me. And probably 10 is pretty good for other people with anemia who, who live this. Have you had a crisis and what was your crisis experience like? How have you lived with either hereditary spherocytosis or some other hereditary anemia? How has your experience been? Mine has been pretty mild. That was my first time ever having a crisis or something very, very serious happen to me, but it was very, very scary. It was very, very hard. Oh. So, all the questions. No, I can't take more iron. <laughs> Isn't that the question? Well, can't you just take some iron? Isn't there some kind of nutrition? No, I can't. <laughs> it's not a nutrition issue. It's not an iron deficiency issue. The frustration of all of those questions. I'm sure you feel me on that. You, you, I wish I could just take some iron and this could go away and be better. Wouldn't that be great? But I know that there's a lot of my spherocytosis brothers and sisters who are not mild. And I definitely, once again, feel for you. Um, and if you've had a splenectomy or not, or I've had my gallbladder removed as a result, that was probably the most, the biggest thing that had ever happened to me relating to this um, prior to last month. But if you made it to the end, thank you so much for listening to my story. Again, I'd love to hear your story. Love to hear how you live with hereditary spherocytosis or your loved one does. And again, thank you so much, so much, so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>